tonight than I have been in the past because uh, I'm a little different <laughs> tonight from when I've been here in the past. And uh, uh, this is a special place to us. And uh, I've, uh, man, I, I feel like I was a baby when I first started coming here. And in a lot of ways I was. I've got a lot of good friends here. And our, our family has a lot of good friends here. And uh, I appreciate Pastor Grit and his faithfulness uh, for 40 years. And uh, did, by the way, did you get my letter to, I know they sent, I'd sent something. I don't know if all that came in. And, and I, I, <laughs> fantastic. And, and I appreciate it so much. And the opportunities that he has given me through the years to preach here and to try to be a blessing and encouragement and, and uh, you know, to give my mom what's for every now and then because she, Lord knows, she gave it to me on more than one occasion. So, you know, preach to mom every now and then to give her a little back, <laughs> you know. But uh, uh, I, I appreciate the privilege and, and the opportunity. It certainly is a different day uh, in my life and, and in our ministry. And I want you to turn the Bibles to Second Corinthians chapter 4. And uh, you'll have to bear with me. Um, this is only my second time in the pulpit since Stephanie went home to be with the Lord. And um, you got to get back on the horse. You got to rip the scab off, rip the band aid off, whatever you want to say. Um, and uh, I get on an airplane and fly home tomorrow. And, and uh, I'm going to be back in my pulpit on Sunday. We start our mission conference. And uh, I'm going to be on the platform. I'm not preaching. Uh, but um, I'll do that the following Sunday. And I covet your prayers. Um, it's going to be different to uh, stand and preach without her sitting where she always sat. And uh, I'm going to need the Lord's help for that. I told my church before I left, they were all worried that I was leaving and, and that I was maybe going to resign and go away and I told him I wasn't going to do that it's this isn't a faith crisis for me you know you hear a lot about that over the last few months all these big name preachers and committing suicide and big name Christian artists and so forth uh, leaving the faith and becoming atheist and you know having a crisis of faith and walking away from it and I said that's I don't this isn't a faith crisis for me. I know whom I've believed it, and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. But I said, I am, I do need some time. I, I don't know how to be an adult, let alone be a preacher without my wife. Um, she was a daily fixture in my life from the time I was 19 years old until, ne until last month. And um, 31 years of marriage and nearly 30 years in the ministry. And uh, I told my staff, I, every good idea that I ever had in 30, nearly 30 years of ministry uh, either came from her or I bounced it off of her or she helped me flesh it out. And um, pray for our church. She's the first pastor's wife. I'm the third pastor there. She's the first pastor's wife that ever led ladies' ministries. Uh, our home was the first pastor's home that any church member had ever been invited to. There had never, and we lived in the parsonage. And in 38 years, there had not been one time where any of the church members had ever been in the pastor's home until we got there. And um, she made a, she left a mark on, on the ladies. When, when she got sick, she was discipling uh, close to 25 ladies on the phone, via text, a little Facebook group from our church. Uh, and those ladies are devastated. And uh, uh, I don't have any, the Lord hasn't given me anybody yet to fill in and take that place for those ladies. And so um, it's, it's going to be different uh, to figure out what I'm going to do and where I'm going to go. How in the world am I going to pastor without her? And, and uh, you know, plus how to, you know, how to keep all the, you know, the talkers and the gossip, you know, you got a single pastor, okay, who you, you know, is he going to get married again? Is, is, you know, he's often talking to that lady a little longer than he probably should be and, you know, all that kind of thing. And, you know, so, you know, I, I told my staff, you're, you're just going to have to run interference for me. <laughs> and, uh, 
But uh, we got a great church, and I'll say more about that as we go. And they've been such a blessing. And many of you, maybe you didn't know that we were in Washington, and I didn't realize, Pastor, you didn't know that until recently. And, but Second um, Corinthians chapter 4, I want you to look at verse 1, because it's a very important verse to my wife and I. Second Corinthians 4, verse 1, the Apostle Paul said, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We... Um, Back in 2017, really felt like that our ministry in Ohio was done, that we had done all that we could, and maybe God was moving us. And uh, I'm not going to go into the whole story about you know how all of that done, but Stephanie came home from teaching school one day, and I said, I got a phone call from a church today in Washington. And the state, yeah, the state. And you told them no, right? <laughs> no, and uh, I didn't. And, but we began to talk with them, and... Uh, I told him, I said, I've got to pray about this. I might as well be going to Brazil or Australia. I mean, the state of Washington, my goodness. And uh, the pastor there, Pastor Gore, had been there 30 years. And he said, well, he said, Brother Curry, this is the mission field. It's a very pagan place. Uh, as a matter of fact, Barna did a study and it released probably, over, it might be five years ago now. Uh, but in Barna's research and study that they did, and the, the study was the religious adherence of America and what religions were here, how involved people were in those religions and so forth. Uh, they found the entire population of Washington, less than 1% of the population, claims, to, claims any religious adherence at all. Uh, one of the most unchurched, states in all of America and uh, there, there are some good churches there. They, they tend to be small uh, and um, there are a lot of churches that are entertainment centers. There are a lot of churches that do a lot of things but preach the gospel. Uh, there are a lot of churches that are very, as we live, anybody, you know, the West Coast is pretty liberal <laughs> and Washington is no exception. And, uh, and so there are a lot of churches that are very liberal in their theology and, and all of those kinds of things. And so we prayed and we prayed and we went out for a visit and we fell in love with it and God knit our hearts to them and their hearts to us. And so in July of 2017, uh, we packed up all of our belongings in Ohio and it took us seven days to drive to Washington. And uh, we're in the we're in the Mount Rain, the Valley of Mount Rainier, and uh, we 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 have lahar drills once a month. That's in case the Mountain blows and lava comes spewing down and all that. We're told when the alarm goes off, we've got 45 minutes to get to high ground or else we're going to be swallowed up. And the only problem is there's so much traffic out there. You need three hours to get to high ground. So I said, I'm just going to pop the top on my Diet Mountain Dew and sit on my porch and say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And, uh, you know, that just be the way that's going to be. But um, we're not too far out of Joint Base Lewis McCord. There's a large military presence there. And... And uh, God's given, a, there's a, planted a wonderful church. And, and um, we were there about a year. We had just got home from our uh, 30th wedding anniversary trip. And uh, noticed Stephanie had, she just was having a bad day. And by the time we got home, she said, something's not right. And she couldn't remember where we were at. She couldn't, uh, she couldn't remember the name of our dogs. If you know anything about my wife, you heard her speak. She talked about her dogs. They were, you know, I think, you know, our boys tease her that she loved those dogs more than she loved them. And, and um, so I, I, I couldn't get her to get back in the car to go to the hospital. And so I called the rescue squad and I thought she was having a stroke. She's 50 years old. And uh, I, got, I, I, I got to the, I got things closed up and I got to the hospital and they already had her in having a CT scan and the doctor came in and, and he said, well, he said, it's not a stroke. That's the good news. The bad news is there's a large mass on her brain and I'm 99% sure it's cancer. I mean, we can't do anything about it here. You're going to have to go to Tacoma General. And that was on a Friday night. Saturday, they did an MRI and the neurosurgeon came in and said, I believe it's cancer. I'm going to have to operate tomorrow. And he said, you just need to prepare yourself. Uh, they weren't sure she'd make it out of surgery. They weren't sure that, uh, that if she did come out of surgery, she wouldn't be an invalid. She wouldn't be able to speak. They just didn't know what would happen because the, 
the kind of cancer she had is not just a tumor in the brain, it's where the actual brain tissue becomes the tumor itself, and they were going to have to take some of it out. And so she survived all that, went, went well, and started treatments, and, but um, things in our life really began to change. Things in our ministry really began to change, and our church rallied around us and helped us, and uh, man, for four months after her surgery, we had meals prepared for us every night by our church family. Um, they would come and sit with us. Uh, there was a crew of ladies that came and cleaned our house, and I couldn't make them stop cleaning our house. No, we want to, we want to help Steph, and we know she'd have it clean. And, and um, after she kind of got through and she kind of settled into what was her new normal, um, we started talking about this verse, and this became our our verse for the year. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we've received mercy, we faint not. See, our ministry changed a year ago. What we were doing and what we had been involved in, it changed. She couldn't be involved like she was, and things were different. There's a lot of times that she couldn't go to church, and things that she had led and done, she couldn't do anymore. And, but she was determined that while our minist her ministry personally had changed, she was going to honor the Lord anyhow as best she could. And so we, this, we kind of adopted this. This is our ministry. Now, we, listen, when we moved to Washington, we were determined that we were going to go and we were going to pastor that church and we were going to pastor that beautiful little town. And, and uh, if, if you want to see some of the most incredible calendar-worthy pictures... Uh, man, I can show you some. Get on my Facebook. There are some just our front porch of the parsonage faces Mount Rainier, and the sunsets are incredible, and uh, it is just gorgeous. We got our first snowfall, and the, the, the mountain is now covered in snow again, and it's absolutely gorgeous. We determined we were going to live our lives out pastoring that town and pastoring that church and grow old together sitting on a rocking chair looking at the mountain until the Lord took us home. And a year ago all that changed. And God said, I got a different plan. And so we adopted that verse. And, and I, I began really kind of studying through this passage. And, and I want you to notice what Paul says in verse number 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. The glory of God is, it's not about us, it's about Him. It's not about who and what we are. It's not about what we can do for God. It's what God does in us. And the fact of the matter is, man, I, I didn't feel like I had the power and strength to go on. I, I tried to be strong for my church. I tried to be strong for my wife and for my family. But, I mean, I, Lord, what are you doing? I don't get it. I don't understand it. Why in the world would you bring me out here? I, got no, I, I knew nobody west of the Mississippi when we moved out there. Nobody. Our family's all back here. And, uh, ministry's different. Culture's different. It's not the Bible Belt out there, brother. <laughs> there ain't, ain't even, I mean, they, they wear shorts and flip-flops to church. I'm telling you, it's just different. Lord, what, what are you doing? Well, the excellency of the powers of God, not of us. Notice what he says in verse 8, though. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Well, I begin to think about that and meditate on those verses. And, and it dawned on me that what Paul's telling us here is that sometimes bad things do happen to good people. You know, have you ever wondered why Christians experience pain and affliction and tragedy just like unsafe people do? After all, we're God's children. We ought to be special. Why do the same things, bad things that happen to unsafe people who, bless God, deserve it, why does that kind of stuff happen to us? We're faithful. We love the Lord. We serve the Lord. We go to church every Sunday. We tithe. We give. God, why are you doing this to us? We're not pagans. We're not heathens. You know, see, I, I found through my life that it's not the normal demands of life that break us down. 
It's those unexpected, painful surprises <laughs> that knock us into next week. See, there are times when we find ourselves fighting battles with pain and tragedy and affliction and disease. And, man, we never declared, we never wanted, we never looked for, we certainly don't deserve it. And so we begin to carry burdens that we don't even begin to understand. And then we start to ask questions. We start to wonder if perhaps we've been cheated somehow. We, we're tempted to doubt that life makes any sense at all. And so then we start, well, why me? Why us? <laughs> why now? Oh, uh, the fact is, sooner or later, every single one of us are going to ask those questions. We're, 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 we're going to walk through that process. And, and, you know, and, and I, I've thought, why on earth, after somebody's been saved and their name's been put in the Lamb's Book of Life and God's put us into His family, why does a Christian have to suffer like an unsaved person does? And for questions like that, I'm glad Psalm 34, 19 is in the Bible. The Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. And, and, and I, can I, I'm just going to stubborn. By the way, what time am I supposed to be done? Well, yeah, that's, <laughs> that, that's a dangerous thing. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> but um, I want you to understand, I don't have the answers tonight. And so if you're thinking, oh, he's preaching on this, he must have an answer. I don't. Matter of fact, in the last month, I'll be honest with you, I got more questions than I got answers. But I do know one thing. There are certain things that are very clearly taught in the Bible. And what's taught in the Bible, we can't understand because the Holy Spirit of God is our teacher. And several years ago, I, I heard a preacher say three things that I amen really loud. Bless God, that's right, amen. Oh, that's good preaching. But the last Sunday that I preached before the Lord took Stephanie home, the Lord put on my heart to work those three statements into a message. Little did I know that I was going to have to start practicing what I preached. So I want to share those thoughts with you. And I'm not going to preach the whole message because... I don't know that I can get through it, and I'll certainly, I don't want to keep you here very long. I want to be a help and an encouragement. I'd rather leave you wanting more than saying, man, I'm glad he shut up. <laughs> you, know, you know, the mind can't take in what the seat can't endure, amen? So, we'll, we'll, you know, I'll tell you the same thing Elizabeth Taylor told her eighth husband, I won't keep you long, amen? All right? So, but there are, there, there are, three, there are three truths that, that I think the Bible very clearly teaches. Number one is this. There are afflictions which we can easily understand. There are afflictions that we can easily understand. The Bible tells us all kinds of passages that tell us that sometimes physical pain or tragedy or affliction comes upon us because we violated something in the Word or the will of God. Let me show you what I mean. Let's go leave your finger there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 or leave a marker there. Go to Psalm 119 with me tonight. Psalm 119. Psalm 119 verse 65. Psalm 119 verse 65 says this, Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Now notice verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now have I kept thy word. Isn't that interesting? The psalmist says when you or I get out of fellowship with God, that God's going to bring physical effect into our life. And the purpose of that affliction, that purpose of, of, of that chastisement, if you will, is to bring us back into fellowship with God. Now look at verse 67 again. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I've kept thy word. He continues the same thought. Look at verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn thy statutes. I don't know about you, but that sits a little odd with me. How many of you here say, oh, I love it when I'm afflicted? That's a good thing. You know, I don't think that's what one of those charismatic preachers had in mind when he said something good's going to happen to you. You know, I don't think that's what he had in mind. But that's what God says. 
It's good for me that I've been afflicted. Why? That I might learn thy statutes. David's saying, if I hadn't been afflicted, I'd still be backslidden. If I hadn't been afflicted, I, I'd still be drifting further and further away from God. But God cared enough for me to bring me back and he used affliction to do that. Look at verse 75. I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hath afflicted me. Wow. Again, the point is God will use physical affliction to draw us back to himself when we drift away from the Lord. And so maybe you're here tonight. I'll just throw this out here to you that uh, you know you're out of the will of God. You know you're not in fellowship with your heavenly father. You know maybe you're, you're just not where God would want you to be. Then if that's you, then I, I'm here to tell you tonight that based on the authority of the word of God, you just need to expect affliction to come into your life at some point or another. You got God's word on that. Now, why is that? Because according to Hebrews chapter 12, the child of God ought to expect God their father to chasten them. Hebrews chapter 12. You with me? You know, you've forgotten the exhortation which speaketh to you as the children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, he says, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Right? So David tells us in Psalms 119 verse 75, in faithfulness thou has afflicted to me. So listen carefully what, what, I'm, what I want you to get tonight. If you're a child of God and, and, and you know the dangers of drugs and alcohol and cigarettes and overeating and all of that kind of thing. And, and you persist and insist on polluting your body with those kind of things. Then you just need to expect one day you're going to get sick and you're going to have physical problems as a result of that. It ought not to surprise us when somebody who smokes three packs a, a day for 30 years ends up with lung cancer. It, it, it ought not surprise us when somebody who drinks alcohol like a fish ends up pickling his liver. All right? Just, it ought not to surprise us. Amen? You know, the, it ought not to surprise us when the, the dope addict ha, it gets addicted and has all kinds of problems on that. It's just the natural consequence of our choices, Right? You're going to reap what you sow. It's a Bible principle. We can't escape that. All right? Uh, if you're a child of God and you're involved in immoral living, then don't be surprised and don't get mad at God and don't get mad at the world when you experience the, the heartbreak and the tragedy that's so often associated with that kind of lifestyle. It's just going to happen. By the way, if you're a child of God and you're carrying in your life bitterness or hate or, or anger or resentment or evil speaking, so don't be surprised when you have physical and emotional problems in your life. You can take all kinds of medications and visit all the therapists in the world all day long, but peace doesn't come in a prescription bottle and it isn't found in the wisdom of man. It's only going to come to the Christian when they get right with God and they get right with others around them. That's the only place it comes from. Now listen, that may be hard to hear, but it's Bible truth. So there are some afflictions we can easily understand because we don't even need to ask why they come. We know why they come. We're out of the will of God and God is chasing us. But by the way, let, let me say this too. Not all sickness, pain, suffering, and affliction is a result of sin in our life. Okay? I hope you understand that. The, the example of Job teaches us that. Amen? But regardless, we have to allow that some of what we experience when it comes to pain and affliction and so forth in our life is a result of our own making. So there are some afflictions which we can easily understand. Number two, there are some afflictions we may eventually understand. There are difficulties that come into our life and we have no explanation right now. But somewhere down the road, God kind of gives us and shows us the reason. I mean, here you are, you're a child of God, you're living in the center of God's will, you're, you're walking with the Lord as best you know how, and there's no hidden, unconfessed sin in your life and that, that you know of, and wham, all of a sudden, man, just huh, some disaster or distress or difficulty or disease strikes, and you're left totally confused as to why. You can't even begin to comprehend the reason for it all. And, and listen, I, I'm not telling this church something they don't know. There are a lot of godly folks in this room who could stand and testify to the truth of what I just said. 
But there have been times in my life in the past where some event that I didn't ask for, some pain or suffering that I did not cause has come about and I couldn't explain it. I, I couldn't even begin to understand what it was all supposed to mean at that time. But in the days, the weeks, maybe a year or so later, God's purpose was clearly seen. And today, at least, I can understand something about it that I didn't understand then. Many of you know my, my, my father died when I was 10. and I, I had no reason, didn't understand all of that and everything that went into that. And, you know, but it wasn't until later I realized that, boy, there were a lot of things that because of all of that, that helped me to be able to be the preacher and the minister and the youth pastor that I've been these 30 years. You know, I, 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 I've had many times over the last uh, years of my ministry that I could sit down with a, with a child or with a teenager who lost a parent and say, you know what, I know how you feel. I've been there. I've walked that road. I, I didn't just have sympathy for them, but I had empathy with them because, man, I've been there. You know, I, I've been, when I was a youth pastor, even as a pastor, I, man, I, you know, I, I lived in a step-parent family. I'm glad I didn't have the horror stories in my life with a step-parent the way some kids have had. But I've been able to talk kids through that and help them navigate those step-parent waters because, you know what, I, I, you know, I, I had that experience in my background, too. See, what, what I'm saying there, for some things, I look back over my life and, and I can see now that there were some things that happened because God had something better for me and, and, and what, what God put me through was His way of moving me in a better or a different direction. There are things where I can see now that God was trying to teach me something that I would not have ever understood had I not been brought into that specific difficulty. I can see now that God's timing was different than my timing and and God had to do something different to, to stop me or to hurry me along. And, and through it all, God needed to show me His power so that He would get the glory, not me. And so there are things that are eventually understood. You know, I like Isaiah 30 verse 20 talks about that now we can see our teachers. And the word teachers there could also be translated reasons. Now we'll see. There are things sometimes God will eventually show us our reasons. But the truth is God doesn't have to. So there are tragedies that we can easily explain. We know right away why. There are tragedies that, that we may eventually explain. Because we understand what God's doing then. What we don't understand now. But there's one other and that's this, there are afflictions that will only be providentially understood. These are the difficulties and the tragedies and the heartaches that are the most difficult to accept. Because they're hard to understand if we can ever understand them at all. And it's those kind of situations that only heaven will be able to explain and reveal the reason for. There have been times I've been in a hospital room or in a funeral home, Pastor Gritton, and people have asked me, Pastor, can't you tell me why? Preacher, why did this happen? And, and I've had to look at them, and all I can say is, I don't know. I, I don't know. We just have to leave that in God's hands. Can I tell you something I've learned over the last month? Sometimes that answer is not enough. I'm just being real with you. Sometimes we as preachers, you know, we give the answer that we know is right. The answer that we know is Bible. But at that moment, it's so inadequate to the human heart. Preacher, that's blasphemous. No, that's humanity. It's real. See, there's a pain there that only the Holy Spirit of God can touch and fix. There, there's a hole that only God can, can, can fill and, and remove. Sometimes we just don't have the answers. 
But what we don't know now, I can only trust that one day in heaven, God will reveal it to us. And we will know then that our Heavenly Father knows what's best and He makes no mistakes. Well, we sing that, right? I know God makes no mistakes. He knoweth every path I take along the way. That's you know, and we sing it and we amen it until we live it. And then we cuss it. Come on, let's just be real. Well, I'd never cuss it, no, but if somebody else wrote it down, you'd sign it. There are some things that come into our life we're never going to understand this side of eternity. I believe that, and, and I've experienced that. And the only possible thing, reason that we can conclude is the sovereignty of Almighty God. Romans chapter 9, verse 14 Ask this question, is there unrighteousness with God? <laughs> the answer to that is, of course not. Folks, we must not and we cannot put God on the witness stand. God is not answerable to man, you realize that. Man's answerable to Him. And God is sovereign in the affairs of man. And whatever God does is right. Whatever God does is just. And Psalm 145, 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all His ways and holy in all His works. As you and I walk the pathway of life, we're going to find that, man, sometimes there are pains and afflictions and tragedies that come our way that we immediately know why. And then, then we're going to run into some where we're like, well, I don't understand it now, but, all of it, but later God will show us and we'll say, oh, okay, that at least makes some sense. But there are also going to be those that no matter how long we think about it, no matter how long we live with it, no matter how many times we ask God about it, we're never going to know until God tells us if He so chooses. And boy, the, the truth is, those are the times that try men's souls. Those are the times that test our faith. Those are the times that we say, Lord, why me? What on earth are you doing? And I believe it's in those times God looks down and says, Child, I'm sovereign. I got the right to do what I please in your life without question because I have your best in my heart. That's hard to hear and that's impossible to understand in our finite mind. It hurts and it confuses. But can I tell you this tonight? Our God's not heartless. He's not. And He gives us a verse for those times. It's a verse we all know. We've probably all got memorized. And it's not cliche, but it's true. 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Casting all your care upon Him. For He careth for you. See, that word casting there means to throw onto. It has the idea of a child saying to a parent, this box or this bag is too heavy for me uh, to carry. Would you carry it for me? And then they just thrust it into the arms of their parent and leave it for them. The word cares literally means worry or anxiety. Well, how easy it is for us to lie when we sing. You know what I mean? Baptists are good at lying when they sing. You know, I surrender all, except that, right? You know, you know, and take your burden to the Lord and leave it there. Yeah, no, God, you don't want to handle this. All your anxiety, all your care, bring to the mercy seat, leave it there. But I'm going to pick it up and take it with me when I go home. We're good liars when we sing. But can I, with... When, when you look at what those two words mean, I think we could easily rephrase 1 Peter 5, 7 to say, throw all the weight of your worry and anxiety on your God because you are always in your God's care. You know what God does for those who do that? I got thinking about that and the Lord reading and studying and that through and a couple of things stood out when when we will cast our anxiety and, and listen I'm preaching to me right now because I'll be honest with you what I'm about to tell you I have been struggling with for the last 30 days it's not easy and I find myself not doing what I'm telling you to do <laughs> I'm just being honest 
but I know it's right, and, 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 I, and I'm, I'm, I'm learning that this is the way to handle that. When you and I will cast all of our anxiety and worry on him, number one, he'll give you courage to face life honestly. Boy, we need that. See, our tendency as human beings is to either run away from problems or to get bitter about our problems. I don't know about you, but I found out you can't run away from your problems. They're, they're tied to you. They're going to follow you. You know, how many church members I've known over 30 years of ministry that run away from the problem here only to find out every church they go to has the exact same problem. And preacher, it never dawns on them that the problem might be there. Never does. Or else they get mad and bitter at God. See, facing the situation honestly may include that we have to accept that handicap or we have to accept that sickness or even we have to accept that death. Doesn't the Bible tell us, if, didn't Job give us the idea that if we want to enjoy the blessings of life, that we have to be willing to accept the burdens that go along with it too? God will give us the courage to face life honestly. Ah, the last 30 days I have had fear and anxiety, panic attacks like I have never had in my life. I'm 52 years old, never had those. And, whew, Lord, what in the world? I, I've prayed more for the rapture preacher in the last month than I have in my entire life. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't want to be here. Lord, why, why'd you leave me? I, I'd just soon be in heaven. Why don't we go together? That, that'd be awesome. I want to be here. I got a job to do. I got to figure out how to do it. But the Lord will give me courage to face life honestly. Number two, he'll give you wisdom to understand what has to be done. Now that doesn't mean he's going to hand you some kind of operation manual that explains why everything happened as it did and what his purpose that he plans to achieve is. But I do know this, James 1, 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth all men liberally, and upbraideth not. Right? Thomas Aquinas, one of the great church fathers of centuries ago, made this statement, to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. Wow. I may not understand why God says no, but I'm sure glad God knows. Think about that. Chew on that a little bit. Number three, he'll give you strength to do what's necessary and right. My mom's favorite verse was Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Aren't you glad that's true? Did you ever stop and consider why that's true? I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Why? Because Psalm 46.1 is in the Bible. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Wow. God will give you the strength to do what's necessary and what's right when the time comes. Number four... He gives you faith to be patient while he works out his perfect will. Preacher, there's, I've become very aware that God right now is making me face and handle and get a grip on the two things in life that I am terrified of and that I absolutely hate. Number one, I hate being alone. I don't understand people who are loners. Uh, those, kind of, those, those people freak me out. It's just not natural. It's not good for man to be alone. The Bible says that. Amen? I, I, I hate being alone. I hate being in the dark. I, 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 you know, I, I'm, just, I'm a people person. I've always been around people. I don't like being by myself. And I'm facing the prospect of spending the rest of my life alone. Now, I, I, I know some of you spiritual people are like, Preacher, you're never alone. Jesus promised to never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I know that. But that's not what I'm talking about, and you know it. Amen? Some of you know, you, you're, you're already where I am. And you've been there a lot longer than I've been here. God will give me patience to get through that. Somehow, some way, I, I don't know and I don't understand it, but He will. But the second thing that I... 
am not good at and I absolutely hate is patience. I'm not a patient person. Never have been. I, I, I want to, you know, Lord, help me get through this, these stages of grief and do it today because I need to get on with my life. <laughs> it's not the way it works, is it? Got to be patient. I, I, people that, who don't immediately push the gas when the light turns green ought not to be on the road. You know, I, I just, they need to have their license revoked. You know, I get behind somebody who doesn't understand what the turn lane is for. Don't stop in the lane waiting to turn. That's, get old, that's what that's for. I just get impatient with people like that. I've always been that way. One of the first things that my that I when I knew I was in trouble with my sons was, you know, uh, sitting at a red. I think one of my boys was three or four, and I didn't even have a chance. The light turned green, and from the back seat of my car, it's not getting any greener. <laughs> I wonder where he heard. My wife looked at me. I wonder where he heard that. I don't have a clue where he heard that. I'm not a patient person. But God will give me faith to be patient. See, it takes faith to be patient, but unfortunately it takes trials to make us patient. <laughs> I, I am messed up either way, amen. Oh, but I, I think of Psalm 46.10, God says, be still and know that I am God. I don't know about you, but that verse convicts me. It rebukes me often. If that verse were written in today's jargon, I think it would say, relax, chill. Just take your hands off. Everything's going to be okay because I've got it under control. The fact is, God is providentially at work in our life. And so the events, whether they're times of distress or difficulty or disease, they're appointments, not accidents. Because God's working out His perfect will in our life. Why? Because Romans 8.28 we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them are according, according, who are called according to His purpose, right? We know that verse. We love that verse, don't we? Oh, can I tell you something? I've struggled with that verse my entire life. Man, I, I, I remember as a kid, talking, people talking about Dad. Well, you know, all things work together. They, oh, shut up. I don't want to hear that. You know, now, it's in the Bible, and it's true. But it takes some maturity to accept that. It takes some maturity to understand that. I was talking to Pastor Phil Newman yesterday. I had some time with them. And, and they talked about the very thing when Lisa and Laura were killed. And, you know, people would come up and say, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28. And they both said, we hated that verse. It used to tick us off when people would tell us that. It's real easy for you to say that. You're not living it. You know what? They're right. But it doesn't change the truth of it. See, the, the truth is God has, it's not, that verse isn't a cop out. It's not just a verse there for God to give preachers something to say when they don't know what else to say. You with me? You understand what I'm talking about, don't you? God has given us his promise to assure us and encourage us in the dark days of our life. And the fact is bad things do happen to good people. But when that happens, we got to remember casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Why should we do that? Because Romans 8, 28 is in the Bible. And we do know that all things work together for good to them that love God. By the way, how do I know that God cares for me and God cares for you? The greatest proof of that is what he did on the cross with his only begotten son 2,000 years ago. Amen. Listen, that was God's greatest and final answer to the suffering and sin of man. Do we need better proof that Romans 8, 28 is true than that? The Bible tells us, For Christ also once suffered for sin, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The death of Christ on the cross. Remember, the innocent dying for the guilty, the sinless suffering for the sinful, the righteous dying for the wicked. Listen, that certainly worked out for our good, didn't it? <laughs> sure it did. Jesus loved God and Jesus was true to the purpose his heavenly father called him to do on this earth. The truth is, 
If God cared enough about you to send His only begotten Son to suffer and die on the cross to pay your sin debt, then, friend, He certainly cares enough about you to carry and help you through any suffering you may experience in this life. See, there are some things that happen and we know immediately why. There are some things that happen that we may not know why now, but eventually we come to understand. But there are going to be things in life that we'll only providentially understand. So what do we do? We do what Psalm 37, 5 says. Commit thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in Him. And He shall bring it to pass. Lord, I'm going to do my part. I'm going to trust you to do your part, and I'm going to leave the results up to you. I, I don't know what God's got planned for me. I'm going to go back to my church, and I'm going to do my best to pastor my people. I don't know how in the world I'm going to do that. I haven't got a clue how that's going to work without her. But God does. God does. I'm under no guise it's going to be easy. And um, I'm a mess. <laughs> Got friends that call me and, how you doing? Well, what minute is it? <laughs> I'll, I'll let you know. I, I, I'm okay right now, but five minutes from now, I, I'm not guaranteeing anything. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. You are there. But God's been good. And God is good, and God will always be good. So, see, now we have this ministry. As we've received mercy, we faint not. When she first got sick, we began to pray, and had a friend of mine, we, I talked, and, and we, you know, every, I can, I can say this, every prayer that we ask God for in relation to Stephanie God answered everyone. We prayed that she would make it to David's wedding. Our youngest son graduated from PCC in May and got married that same weekend. A graduation on Friday and wedding on Saturday. She was able to get on a plane, walk through the airport, participate in all of those wedding things. And a month later, she couldn't walk. A month after that, she couldn't talk. God got us through it. We prayed that there would be no pain and no suffering, and there wasn't. Not one time. There were a lot of things specific that, that we prayed for, and God answered every one. Because God's good. Our church has been phenomenal. I, I wish I had an hour to tell you. Man, it's a different place, but those people are... are it's, we were... Stephanie was the happiest, most content she'd ever been in serving the Lord... And God gave us some wonderful people. It's not, it's not every church that would sit the pastor down and say, you're taking a sabbatical whether you want to or not. You need some time to rest and you need some time to get yourself together. And by the way, here's a large check to pay for all of it. Do whatever you need to do. Wow. Without prompt, they, they, they paid all of her funeral expenses in checks of $25, $50 here and there met every need. I've got a freezer full of meals waiting for me when I get home because I want to make sure their pastor has a home-cooked meal every night. I've got a list of ladies that for the next year are signed up to clean our house every week. Just amazing what they've done to help us and minister to us because God's good. I don't know what the future holds, but I'm glad I know who holds my future. And I covet your prayers for, for our church. It's, it's, it's going to be hard for them with her not there. It's going to be hard for me with her not there. But I know God will help us get through. And I know God will get the glory for all of it. 
in the midst of all of this, I'll tell you this, and I'm done. In the midst of all of this, I, I, I haven't, honestly, I really haven't been in the office much at all since April. She needed pretty much round-the-clock care, and, and I was going to do that. I felt pretty bad about that, and my deacon said, Pastor, you're doing what you need to do. You take care of your wife, the staff will take care of the church, and our church is going to take care of you. You do what you need to do to help your wife. Okay. And, um, but I, I felt pretty bad about not having and not being there for them. But yet, through all of that, the month of June and July and August were the three biggest months of our calendar year to date. Our attendance at every service was up over 20%. Our offerings were phenomenal. <laughs> Just the best they had been all year. What church in America grows and increases and blows out the budget in June, July, and August, preacher? You'd take that here, wouldn't you? <laughs> I had nothing to do with that at all. I wasn't even there hardly. And God said, Steve, it's my church. I'll take care of it. You do your part, and I'll do mine. And church, can I tell you tonight, you do your part, God will do his. And he'll get the glory for all of it. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace, for your help, for your strength. God, I pray that somehow, some way, I, I was an encouragement and a blessing to your people tonight. Lord, thank you for what this church has meant in my life and my ministry through the years. Thank you for the encouragement and the help that Pastor Gritton has been to me personally. Lord, I pray that you would bless this place. Lord, use it mightily for you as they stand as a lighthouse for the gospel. Lord, I thank you for the friends that I have here. The people who through the years have meant much to me and influenced my life. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, until we meet again, until we gather around the throne and sing your praises together, Father, I pray that you would use us in Jesus' name. Amen.